Hey, it's Richard. Today I'm going to be talking about how to match color. So what we want to do is think about colors being the main category. And you want to break it up into four parts. Think about color being made up of hue. Hue is the name of a color, like red, yellow, blue, green. So that's uh, generally what you want to think about first. You look out at a tree, you look at the leaves, and you go, well, what color are those leaves? And you're probably going to go, well, they're green. Well, what green are they? And that's what the next three parts are. So hue is pretty easy for most of us. You might want to think about value next. Value is the relative lightness and darkness of your colors, the things you're painting. You've all seen uh, black and white photographs, movies, a lot of artworks done in black and white. So value is probably the main thing. If you get the values right, you're probably going to get a good looking picture. So you'll see right off, the colors will vary in value. Some are lighter, some are darker to start with. Now I'm using watercolor for this demonstration. These rules will apply to any kind of medium you're using to paint with. The big difference is with transparent watercolor, like these, we're not using any white paint. What we're doing is we're adding water to make those colors lighter. Letting more of the paper show through to get a lighter look, more paint to darken things up. The arrangement of your values will create your overall design of your picture. So that's why I think that value is the most important thing. You get those values right, you're going to have a strong, strong looking good picture. The next category is chroma. Chroma is the relative brightness or dullness of a color. Again, you look at the colors, some are brighter to start with, some are duller to start with. The general rule is that the colors are going to be brightest right out of the tube. Pure color. Then when you mix those colors together, they're going to become duller. So the more you mix, the duller those colors will become. The next category is temperature. Temperature is the relative warmness or coolness of a color. Now here we have the 12 step color wheel. Over here we've got the warm colors. Over here we have the cool colors. Easy way to remember them apart is the warm colors will remind you of fire or sunshine. The cool colors remind you of water or ice. Easy. Yeah. So that's what the way you want to think about these colors when you're trying to mix them up. The hue, the value, the chroma, the temperature. You get those things right and your colors will be right on. If something doesn't look correct, think about those things. So the only variance you can have, the only mistakes are you're either too light, too dark, too bright or too dull, too warm or too cool. So think about that and that makes it easy to match up your colors. Now here we have um, some simple things you probably already know about with the color wheel. There's the three primary colors red, yellow, and blue. You have to start with those. You can't mix those. So when you do mix uh, them together, yellow with red, you get orange. Yellow with blue, you get green. Red with, with blue, you're going to get violet. So it gives you the secondary colors. Then if you mix any primary color with one of its neighboring secondary colors, such as yellow, primary color, orange, green being the secondary colors. If you pick one of those, such as orange, mix those two together, what do you get? You get yellow orange. See, it's pretty easy. And then there's yellow green, blue green, blue violet, red violet, and red orange. And that gives you the 12 steps on the color wheel. This is a very easy, convenient way of thinking about color, color theory, color mixing. So keep that straight and it makes it much easier to paint your pictures. 
Now let's put this all together and mix something up. Let's suppose you want to have some violet flowers. And you go, okay, that sounds easy. I want nice bright flowers and, uh, growing out in my backyard. I'm going to turn this into a nice, beautiful looking painting. And you look at your palette and you may find in many cases you don't have a purple to start with. Well, what are you going to do? You think about those rules. Red and blue are going to make violet. You go, okay, that sounds easy. So we look here and we go, all of a sudden, wait a minute, I've got two, two reds and I've got two blues. What am I supposed to pick? Well, you might go, well, on my cadmium red here, that's my brightest red. That looks really good. Then we go, well, what about the blues? It's a little hard to tell them apart when they're in their dry uh, wells like that. If I bring a little bit out here, you can see that difference. And I go, oh, this right here, this is much brighter. This is the phthalo blue. Put that down, you go, oh, wow, look at that. That's nice and bright. So then we're going to go, we're going to mix these two bright colors together and we're going to get a nice bright third color. Except we don't. We go, hey, what happened there? That's not bright enough for my flowers. What do I do to fix this? Well, I've got two other, I've got another red and another blue. So what about this alizarin crimson? Put that down. Now that may not be as bright as the cadmium red, but it sure looks a lot more like violet than that does. What about the blues? There I've got the ultramarine blue and I put that down again. It's not as bright as the phthalo, but it sure looks more like purple than that one does. Mix these two colors together. And I find I get a much brighter third color. Now what happened here? Theoretically, I did the same thing twice, but I got two very different results. I got a dull color, a bright color. Another way of putting it is I got a saturated color, I got a desaturated color. High chroma, low chroma. Why did that happen? Well, if we look at the color wheel and we go, this is what I want to get. I want to get some kind of a bright violet. And that first red I picked, the cadmium red, I'd stick way over here from red getting close to red orange. And with the blue, I do the same thing. I look over in the blue here and I go, oh, that's going over here towards blue green. So those colors are very far apart on the color wheel, which means they've got to go all this distance to get to violet. The further away they are, the more they're going to intermix and the duller they're going to become. Where on the other hand, that second set of colors I picked, the old alizarin crimson, I'd probably put here on the border between red and red violet. And then the ultramarine blue, I definitely put into the blue violet category. So here I've got two colors much closer to each other on the color wheel, which means a shorter trip to violet, which means less intermixing, which is going to equal a higher chroma, brighter third color. And that is sure enough what I got there. So see how that works? The relative position on the color wheel will determine when you mix those colors together, how bright or how dull that third color you mix up will become. Some other things we can do with color mixing. Let's suppose we're going to paint some bricks. And I got, well, I went bright bricks, bricks here. Put that red down and go, hmm, how's that look? Well, that's way too bright for my bricks. I want to dull that color down. Well, if I took some black, mix that in, that sure dulls it down but they don't look like red bricks anymore. Looks way too dark, too dull. I could do the same thing with brown. I could mix that in, that sure enough dulls that red down, but they start becoming more like brown bricks rather than red bricks. All I wanna do is dull that color down. If I take a little bit of green and mix that in, you see how quickly that dulls that red down with just a small amount of green. And you're probably thinking, well, green, well, that seems like the most different color from red that I can think of. And you look at the color wheel and you look straight across in the color wheel and you go, yep, that is an opposite color. That's called a complement or a direct complement. The idea is that small amounts of the opposite color will radically dull down the main color. Because you're using such a small amount, you're changing its value and its 
chroma, its value and its temperature far less than the chroma. The chroma will dull very, very quickly. Now, theoretically, if I mix these two colors together 50-50, I'll get a completely neutralized color. Doesn't quite work that way because red is so much stronger. It's a higher tinting strength than greens. So I'd probably need, in most cases, twice as much green to mix with the red to completely neutralize it or gray it down. But I certainly could do that. Another technique we could use along these lines is if I want to intensify a color, put my red down here and take that same green and put it next to it. So rather than mix these together, which will give me a duller effect, if I mix them next to each other, I get a intensifying effect, making that red even brighter, even stronger, because of its relationship of its opposite color to each other. This is called a complementary accent. This was one of the tricks the Impressionists use. You look at their paintings, you'll see this all the time. To make the colors look stronger, they put the opposite or complementary colors next to it. 